the Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. Get our complimentary newsletter at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. This is the Financial Survival Network. Financial Survival Network is presented to you by Regal Assets. Buy and sell physical gold and silver through your existing retirement plan, 100% tax-free with Regal Assets. If you want to include physical gold or silver in your existing IRA or old 401k, request your free investment kit, which was recently featured in the Forbes and Smart Money Wall Street Journal magazines. Call toll-free 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, or visit Regal assets.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Value Guys Stock Talk Show with the Value Guys. I'm Val Hughes. And I'm Momentum. And we are 31-year Wall Street veterans who have had to take on secret identities and go underground in order to provide you with our candid views on a handful of stocks we screen for each week here in the shop. Uh, You've seen our faces on TV. You've seen us quoted in the news, but our bosses would never allow our unfiltered views on the air. So we've disguised our voices, and they'll never know. This week, it's August 4th, 2012. Again, we did a push-button screen on the DuPont formula, and so the screen took the best return on assets, best return on equity in each sector, and they had to pass both of those screens in order to get on our show this week. But before we get to that, a couple of important caveats. First, this show is for entertainment purposes only. It's not a guarantee. Secondly, Mo and I are professional portfolio managers and analysts during the week, but uh, here it's after hours. We're just relaxing with a couple of adult beverages, and we may not have done all the uh, required due diligence necessary to really know what we're talking about here on the show. We're just looking through a few stock ideas. Spitballing. Yeah. Thank you. Spitballing. And then uh, third, our lawyers say to remind you that uh, we may not have your best interests in mind, so please do your own work or talk to somebody who knows more than we do. And finally, fourth, we have been drinking this week. So, um, and that may be good in this environment. Who knows? See all our disclosures, caveats, photos, uh, links to past shows, links to every show we've done with links to the price charts and news, etc. at www.thevalueguys.com. So... Uh, here we are, Mo. Another week. I think uh, we're going to do a, a, a segment now. I think called uh, Value Guys Wall Street News with momentum. We can do that, but uh, I you want to skip that? Uh, no, no, we can oh. do that. But uh, I did want to make a, a comment about the uh, the screen we ran. Ah, okay. There were sixteen industries. Yeah. That we looked at using this criteria, ROA. ROE, top 20%. So 16 industries. 23 cities. They had an average of, uh, each industry had an average of between two companies to five companies, which made the cut in all of those industries. It's a tough screen. It's a tough screen. No question. Except health technology. Every so, you know, Producer manufacturing, elect- electro technology only had two companies that made that screen, Apple and Seagate. Consumer durables only had one company in their Mattel. But health technology had 20 names, Baxter, hmm. St. Jude, Medical. Yeah, I saw They that. were so overweighted in that group. You know, it's interesting that you say that because I skipped that group. I noticed that. <laughs> you might, and I'm not, and I didn't realize there were that many. But you'd say, "Well, why do you do that?" I think what the market's saying, and I guess also what I'm saying by skipping the group, is that they look, uh, they have had a great history, and in part that's because uh, the the you know the the supply and demand of their products has favored them. They've got people who need the products at any cost. That's the system that we've evolved in healthcare, and that's worth a whole show to talk about the dislocations that creates. But as a result, these companies have had uh, tremendous profits, and some people look at profit as a markup, the way we talk about it sometimes on the show, markup on cost. And in the environment that's coming, I think people feel that perhaps uh, near-term pricing may be under pressure as we have a more government-led uh, you know, s- sort of demand side, 
and uh, and so maybe the profit margins are coming down. That's that's all I can. That's what my instinct says. That's why I didn't look there, and I think that's why, you know, there's so many of them in the screen. Well, they uh, they, they certainly stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Mo? <clears throat> well, I don't. That's why I asked you. Well, I don't know. Okay. I just uh, it it was sort of an anomaly worth checking out. Well, um, so the next few shows. We are going to be, this is for you, listener, we are going to be building on this show our own proprietary equity evaluation formula. We are? We, Did I not get that memo? Though? We are going to join a long list of great financial collaborators who've made financial history. Think Black Shoals. Right. Yep. And we're going to call this formula the Valmentum Ratio. Valmentum? Ratio. But we might need to work on the name, don't you think? I uh, well, what about we may Hughes Mentum? We could, Mentum Hughes. I, we, I mean, we need I, to get a name. We need a name. And each I mean, week, I don't what know we're about gonna, that. and each week we're gonna we're gonna walk through the the creation of this. We are okay. this new ratio. This could be one of the futures standard reference tools. I mean, that's a. Certainly a worthy goal to shoot for. So now, imagine, what, imagine, you, imagine if you could be a fly on the wall when yeah. Markowitz was, you know... You'd have to was, imagine pretty hard. ...was thinking about... Yeah. Look, the, look at all the great collaborative effort. The Merrill, efficient frontier and Merrill all Merrill and Lynch. Yeah. One, if, at one if, point, they didn't know each other, right? What if you could be in one of the very first meetings between those two? Now the listeners get to be in on the first day of collaboration between two... Future financial future greats. Future giants. Right? Future giants. And so, what, wow. what? Well, you know, when you talk about it that way, it's exciting. I want to stay tuned. Well, next show, I'm going to come and ask you what, what you would use on the value side of the ratio. Yeah. And then I will come up with a, some algorithms for the momentum side. Then we have to figure out how we glue it together. Well, you know, there's this old experiment that you could do where what we need to do, and it's not hard for us during the after hours portion of our show, to imagine being in the future, looking at the ratio and using it and Correct. figuring out what it's doing and then and back work backwards, it to work today. backwards from there. Right. Yeah. And so uh, I'm excited to explore these, you know, uncharted uh, waters. So well. stay, stay tuned because that's we're gonna, uh, let me what understand. we're going to start doing next week. Are you week? planning? Are you seriously planning? Because I'm a little sleepy right now, listener. I'm sorry. We're... We're doing the show at off hours. I'm just waking. I'm groggy. It's unusual to be drinking this time of day, but, of course, we do it for the show. Yes. And Mo is throwing all this academic stuff at me. I mean, I, we're, we're ready. I'm ready for that challenge, but let me understand you. Are you saying, Mo, that we are going to take elements from not just one financial statement, not just two, not three, but we might even go to... Four financial statements in terms of the uh, the metrics that we use. They could. This will be a quadro. Uh, no, well, quadro actually, dynamic uh, algorithm. In effect. Um, actually, even more so because more so. it's going to be a three dimensional. Why algorithm. stop at three? Right. Let's well, have one dimension a... for each year we've been in the business. Well, then we could. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I, I can't so we have wait a lot. We have a lot of. Uh, we have a lot All of right. strategizing to do. Um, I'm sorry, did you, by the way, did you have any uh, stories from the 1% this week? I forgot to check in. You know, with the, what, with the stuff you do, I'm sure you had a run in. Do you have. No, no, no. We're still, we're, still, we're still collecting uh, stories for oh, our forthcoming book inside the 1%. You probably dipped into the 2 or 3% this last week and just don't embarrass to say so, probably. Yeah, we, we, haven't, we, haven't come up with, uh, we haven't come up with any new insights from uh, inside the 1%, but stay tuned because we're. Uh, are, are, we are your inside, doing our research on that. We are your inside ears and eyes right. to the group. Because I'm excited to read about all that, what those people do uh, over there. Um, any Wall Street news? Value guys, Wall Street news this week? No, uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna jump into jump the in. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, look, we have uh, basically three ideas this week, but one of them I can't decide between two stocks. I guess, and so. Uh, I threw them both out to talk about. But these all pass this DuPont screen. So these are in the top 20% for their industries of return on assets, return on equity, and about 85 got through that screen. And, and you know, Mo and I sit here and we kind of look through them and we throw a few out on the table. So Ball Corp, ticker BLL, 
uh, got through our rigorous uh, screen here. United Technologies, UTX, and then, uh, and then at the back half, we're going to compare and contrast two stocks that honestly look more alike than you'd expect, or maybe you wouldn't, Apple Inc., A-A-P-L, and Coach, C-O-H, Coach the leather guy, and Apple the consumer technology guy. Uh, but first up, Ball Corp, BLL. Now, this past the screen, again, we've been doing screens here that we use in the shop. The nice thing about a screen is it's past the screen, so you're in the club. It's a good company, uh, so we're digging in a little bit. The valuation on Ball Corp. Well, wait uh, a minute, wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. You know who these guys are, right? They make yeah. the, they make ball jars. Of course. I didn't think uh, I didn't think people actually canned any, or jarred anything anymore. Well, so they I, do. Can so the thing to like I, about I, I, it, I thought these were basically used as drinking glasses in barbecue joints south of the Mason Dixon line. Well, they have a much bigger business now, as you can see, because they sell nine billion dollars. These guys provide. Met, here's why to, here, here's the annuity in here. So right. let's say you think the back half's going to be a little bumpy. You know, we just sold some consumer discretionary in the shop just because we think, you know, you got the fiscal cliff, you got the election just flinging mud at everyone, Americans are going to all feel bad about themselves, people with money are going to hoard it. So it's needs, not wants. These guys make cans that hold all the stuff you need. Not a lot of, not a lot of luxury goods are being served up in metal cans. Think of what's in a metal can. It's stuff that you need, right? right? And so look at their track record here. I'm just saying during this recession that we've supposedly had, uh, these guys, you know, yawn and, and EBITDA and EBIT just continued to go up. Uh, I can't tell you whether there were, you know, acquisitions in there. Uh, there certainly could have been, although their share count has gone largely down. They're taking free cash flow, buying stock, they're putting up uh, upper single-digit returns on assets. They lever that to a 30% return on equity, and you think, wow, that's a lot of leverage. But, um, you know, and they're 70% debt to capital, so some people might not like that. They look dead heavy to some. But these guys probably studied, you know, the science of the perfect capital structure because when you look at the stability of their EBITDA and the probability that it goes outside the range of their fixed charge uh, expense. It's well covered. It's about 10 times. They, they never lose money, although never say never. And then the evaluation, nine times EBITDA, so it, it is toward the high end of its historical range, but I think it's serving a, a nice purpose during these rocky times, which is you've got a pretty certain sales flow and a very stable earnings flow, and that's what attracted me to this name. Well, you know, and... Um this stock is a very accurate reflection of that. Take take a look at the the stock price. Um, I'm eyeballing this, yeah. but it looks to me as though this company declined half of what the market declined during the during 08. Yeah, well, just on the annual basis, it yeah. looks like. But from peak to trough, you know, 12. I mean, they were down more than 50 percent. So. That was a scary time for everyone. And but when you look at them, when you look at them from a market perspective, they didn't decline quite as much as the market. And look what they've done since then. They have outperformed the market. They've probably doubled the market performance since '08. Yeah. No, they. Uh, so this, clearly, this, people are saying, "Yeah, this is a." This index starts in '06. So since '06, yeah. they weathered the storm better, and they've done better since. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, the only other thing I could say about this is because, again, I've tried to do as little work as possible. Um, but they're fairly diversified, you know, around the world. They have a little piece of aerospace, so they, they do have an exposure to growth in aerospace technology, but it's 9% of the business. Um, Wall Street analysts, again, we've talked on past shows, there's been a lot of downward revisions recently as the things slow down. These guys have had a little bit of revisions, but, you know, 4 or 5% type of range, which is, you know, fine to me. They are at the higher end of their historical, you know, earnings yield range. And so I'm not thrilled about paying that. But just like the long bond trading at 1.5% uh, yield, I guess, you know, even a value guy at some point wants part of his portfolio in a harbor. And this one, that's sort of my thesis here, is uh, needs not wants at a good price. And, uh, and I like it, ball, ball, B-L-L. -L. Okay.
You know, I take How are we doing on time, Mo? Do you have to be somewhere or anything? No, nowhere. This is, this is the end. Uh, no one knows where I am. No, so I, don't I, know, no I don't know where I am. Yeah. We're in a secret location here. Um, all right, well, here's another one, again, in this sort of uh, weather the storm theme that I'm feeling today because, uh, you know, it's been a tough few months for all investors, but value guys, portfolios have been hidden here as well. You've got so much uncertainty ahead in the near term, it's, it's not a natural thing. It's, of course, politics and, uh, and things like that, but, you know, you know it's coming. And so and, and there's going to be points in the next six months, I think, where there'll be uh, a lot of fear in the market. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of fiscal cliff discussion, and so uh, we're keeping just a little powder dry to take advantage of some price dips in here, assuming things will get fixed uh, after the election. And so with that theme in mind, United Technologies, again, it's one of these broad-based manufacturers. And I think uh, a, a, a big-level theme here might be that U.S. manufacturing is in the ascension. Why? Well, first, college is expensive, okay? Uh, it's about 10 times more expensive than when I went. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the risk-return now, um, you know, when, when Mo and I got out of college, your first year, you could earn, you know, three or four or five times your last year's tuition. And now it's one times, you know, if you're lucky. So increasingly, uh, there's going to be some labor available, smart labor that doesn't have the money for college. That's one. Secondly, uh, this whole advantage to wages in China, it's sort of reached the point where China's letting their currency float a little bit. Chinese wages have been uh, competitively moving up. So when you decide where to make a factory, it's not a snap decision anymore, just on the pure fundamentals of the value of labor and logistics. And so uh, U.S. winning on that. Third, outsourcing, you can't even say outsourcing any, anymore. It's like the O word. You know? So again, socially, culturally, no one wants to be talking about that. that you know, that's in the picture as well. And then fourth, energy costs in America because of fracking, we now have a global advantage in, in uh, cost of, you know, fuel, and that's drawing chemical companies here. That's going to lower the cost of energy here. And then there's going to be a growing infrastructure for manufacturing in that area that's going to be drawn here, lowering costs, and so that's advantage. So I think generally... Uh, manufacturers are going to be gaining share of GDP for a while here. United Technologies, uh, UTX, it's, uh, you know, it's a diversified manufacturer primarily across four businesses, Pratt & Whitney engines, uh, aerospace engines, Otis elevators, manufacturing and service, carrier air conditioners, and then a broad list of other, which, you know, admittedly, I'm not too sure uh, what it is. I think they have some escalators in there as well. Well, you know, they, they have uh, Sikorsky helicopters. Helicopters, yes. But, you know, when, 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 you, when I first looked at that, I thought it was an odd mix, and then it occurred to me that you, you're, you're basically you're making elevators, you're making HVAs.